So then we can say, okay, I now have this generation. Can I now estimate what's going to be the next generation numbers? And we can actually do this. We can estimate. For population one, where we sampled, we had 56 big Y, big Y, and 38 big Y, little y. So let's say how many beads are there in that population? Well, we know if that because there's 56 big Y, big Y, that's 56 times 2, 112 yellow beads. From the 38 big Y, little y individuals, that is 38 more yellow beads. So we get 112 plus 38 equals 150 yellow beads. From the how many white beads are there? Well, we take the 38 white beads from the big Y, little y population. We add the six big little y, little y individuals, which is six times two for 12 white beads. So you get 38 plus 12 equals 50. So overall, right, there were 150 out of 200 beads. 75% of the beads were yellow, and 25% of the beads were white. So because that's now our population, or that's our numbers of beads, we can actually turn this into um, talking about alleles and allele frequencies. The probability of drawing out a yellow bead from then that population. So if that population were to make a bunch of gametes, the probability that any of those gametes are going to be yellow is 75%. And we're going to refer to this as P. So the allele frequency in that population is P, or 0.75, 75%. By the same token, the probability of drawing out a white bead or the probability of producing a uh, little y gamete from that population is 0.25. So the probability of getting a big y, big y individual is simply the probability of getting two yellow beads from the bucket. So the probability of 0.75 times 0.75 or p times p, which equals 0.56. The probability of two little y's is 0.25 times 0.25, or q times q, which is 0.06. And the probability of a y little of a big y little y is the probability of drawing one white and one yellow. Um, but because we're, we we it could be um, a big y from one parent and a little y from another parent, but it also could be a little y from the first parent and a big y from the second parent. So therefore, it's an, it's an or statement. And if you remember from our rules from um, probability, that, that then means we need to add these things together. So it's actually p times q plus q times p. Or you can change that into 2pq. And that equals then 0.38. So it's 2 times 0.75 times 0.25 equals 0.38. This leads us then into what we're going to call the Hardy-Weinberg equation. These are the two investigators that first kind of described gen population genetics and how, how you can track population estimates from one generation to the next. And, and they basically stated this. They said the, the genotype um, frequency of big Y, big Y, plus the genotypic frequency of big Y, little y, plus the genotypic frequency of little y, little y, equals all of the possible genotypes in that population. So because the genotypic frequency in the next generation of big Y, big Y is p squared, we can say p squared plus 2pq, the heterozygotes, plus q squared, the, the homozygous recessives, equals, of course, 1, or 100%. That is the Hardy-Weinberg equation. p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. We can also think about this instead of probabilities in terms of a Punnett square, where, again, this is the frequency of, the, of one parent making gametes that are going to have a frequency of big Y and a particular frequency of little y. And the other parent is going to produce gametes at the frequency of big Y and the frequency of little y, whatever that is. And so we generally can then bring that back together to the frequency of the big Y, big Y genotype is p squared. The frequency of the big Y, little y is pq. But it's pq down here, so that's where we get our 2pq. And the frequency of little y, little y is q squared. That's where we get our q squared. And if you add all of that up, it equals 100% of the population. So the Hardy-Weinberg equation then also um, brings the idea that if nothing happens to this population through time, you will not expect then the numbers of genotypic frequencies and allele frequencies to change if nothing's happening at all. And this is when we call the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And therefore, the populations um, are not evolving because the allele frequencies are not changing over time. 
So the assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg, though, are that there is no selection happening. So it wasn't better to be white flower colored or yellow flowered colored. Remember, we just talked a lot about natural selection. So we're assuming that none of that is happening, excuse me, in this case. We're also assuming that there is no mutation. No mutations are happening. So you're never getting something that maybe was originally a big Y, but a mutation occurred and somehow that flipped it down into a little Y or into some completely other color, right? We're assuming none of that is happening. We're assuming that there is no migration. In other words, none of the plants in the upper population are, are reproducing with plants from the lower population. It's only pop individuals from the same population are reproducing with each other. We're also assuming, again, this idea of a very large population, so there is no random sampling um, error that is happening or no genetic drift. And finally, we're assuming panmixis, which essentially means we're assuming random fertilization events, right? I mean, bees are coming around and collecting pollen, but they don't care whether it's from a yellow flower or a white flower or whatever, and then they're visiting all flowers randomly, and so there's no um, bias towards yellow flowers only mating with yellow flowers or white flowers only mating with yellow f with white flowers. So to finalize this, then let's bring it back to our question about dominant and recessive. Are dominant alleles necessarily then more common in a population? Well, not necessarily, right? Here are two great examples. It turns out that if you count the number of fingers on and digits and toes on, on these hands and feet, you see there are six. That is because this is an individual who has um, polydactyly, and polydactyly results from it at least one dominant allele. So in other words, 99.99% of the population that have five fingers and toes, they are all homozygous recessives, and that's why they, you have five. If you were to happen to have at least one dominant allele for this, you end up having more digits than five. Another example of this is a particular kind of dwarfism where it is due to a dominant allele that, and if you have at least one of the dominant alleles, you have dwarfism. But this is how also, you know, it's possible that two, uh, a, a dwarfism couple that are both heterozygotes, they could have children then that are completely normal height. So anyway, that brings us to the end of this uh, lecture where we've talked about genetics and how we track genetics through time. We've talked about recessive and, and dominant alleles, and we've been able to show the Hardy-Weinberg um, equation and Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and talk about those subjects as well.